it's unfortunate that your season success is defined by just one outcome, but I, I tried really hard not to look at it that way. They lost to a team that I've said all season long was better than them in their building. The outcome was not a surprise. Hello and welcome in. It's Always College Football. It's a Monday edition of Always College Football, and we'll structure today's show just like we do any other. We'll have our 10 takeaways from the weekend. Takeaways involving Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama. We'll talk a little bit about the Florida State situation. We will talk a little bit about Oregon and Washington. We'll set the table, and then there have been a lot of head coaches that have been hired already at new destinations. So we'll break down the hires of Jonathan Smith at Michigan State. We'll break down the hire of Mike Elko at Texas A&M. And we will also discuss Jeff Levy, who's taken over as the head coach of Mississippi State. We encourage all of you to like, rate, and subscribe, if you can, to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Whether it's on Spotify, leave us a rating. If you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating, leave us a review. You can subscribe to both. Wherever you get your podcast, subscribe to the podcast and download it every day if you could. We'd love it if we could be with you every day here on Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. We have an awesome show. It's one of my favorite shows of the year. We're not just going to set up what happened last weekend, but we'll set the table just a little bit, maybe peek ahead just a little bit with what might be coming as far as coaching carousel and how that thing's starting to spin a little bit. We'll update all the job openings at the moment. There might be more, but at the moment, we'll tell you what's where and a couple candidates to consider at some of the bigger job openings as well. And like we do every single Monday, we're going to give you our top six. Our top six, it probably shouldn't be very dramatic. It's pretty standard. It's one through six, and I'll even tell you who number seven is as well. So let's not waste any time. Let's kick it off with our rankings right here on Always College Football. We'll start with our top six like we do every week. It hasn't changed a whole lot. We've removed Ohio State at the moment. From the top six, that's really the only movement that we have. There isn't a lot. Our rankings, one through six, actually were exactly how the committee had them last week. And I would imagine the committee will have them looking a little like this as well. Number one, the Georgia Bulldogs it remain number one. Those that look at the game this past weekend, looking at the margins, it wasn't a great performance by Georgia, especially on the defensive side, got gashed on the ground. They're still the number one team in my eyes. I think they have the highest ceiling. And if they could figure out some things from the edges of their defense and the run defense, they should be just fine. Michigan's at two, solidified that spot. No doubts whatsoever when we'll break down the Ohio State and Michigan game here in just a minute. But they were exactly who we thought they'd be this past weekend. Washington is in at number three, up a spot because of Ohio State's absence. Rightfully so. I think you can make a case that Washington's resume is pretty good, but there were moments here in the last half of the season that still, I still think there's a gap between one, two, and then there, there's three. I think that gap between two and three is a little bit bigger than it's been in the past. Florida State is at number four. They deserve it. They're undefeated. We must acknowledge the results that have happened this season. They have 12 data points, and they've been successful in each and every one. You can say, well, their resume is not great. They didn't look great. Rotomaker, Rotomaker didn't look great. All those things, fine. But they're still 12-0. and 0. We must acknowledge that. They deserve credit for that. And it's not like they get a great prize at the end, making the playoffs awesome, but they got to face Georgia potentially if Georgia holds serve in the SEC title game. So that'll be interesting. They're in at number four. At number five, it's Oregon. Oregon, I think resume-wise now, depending on where Oregon State falls to, they at least now have a top 25 win at their disposal. They did not have that last week. Utah was their only top 25 win earlier in the season, but they've since dropped out. So Oregon's in a good position to win and in this weekend in the Pac-12 title game and then the Texas Longhorns. They have the head-to-head -head against Alabama. They will, at least at the moment, sit there at number six. I still think they need help, though. Based on where the rad right now, I think the top five are all win and end scenarios, but Texas needs help. They need one upset in SEC championship or in the ACC championship. And if you think that Michigan's going to lose to Iowa, I don't agree with that. <laughs> Oregon and Washington's winning in. Florida State's winning in. Georgia, of course, winning in. And then it becomes very interesting in the event in which there's two 
upsets in conference championship games, then that could open the door for Alabama. If they beat Georgia, that would be one. If Florida State loses, that would be two. If Texas loses, then that would be three. They need two, I think, to potentially punch their ticket. They'd be in for me at number seven. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta will be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating. Pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Takeaway number one, Michigan is the standard in the Big Ten. We were pretty close on this one with how we assumed it might go. There were more points scored than we anticipated, but at the same time, I thought we kind of assessed how the game would go, some of the keys to the game and what ultimately decided it. Now, Blake Corum went for 88 yards and a couple touchdowns. J.J. McCarthy, not massive numbers, but some timely throws and very efficient on 16 of 20. And when you look at J.J. McCarthy, we'll start there. We had talked a little bit about whether or not in the absence of a receiver or a dynamic receiver, would he be able to make the throws? We talked about Colston Loveland. Would he step up? He led the Wolverines in receiving and looked really good in the process. But the throw that J.J. McCarthy made to Roman Wilson shows just how much he's progressed as a player. If that ball was off by just a foot, in either direction, it's incomplete. If it's a little bit low, it would have been tougher for Wilson to drag the ball in. But he squeezed that into a window that was no more than two or three feet wide from about 20, 22 yards away. That was a big time throw. And it was an aggressive throw, too. And somehow he's able to fit it in there. And Wilson was able to hold on long enough to preserve the touchdown, even though Denzel Burke obviously tried to rip it out of his hands at the end. It was a bang-bang play. And one that I thought the replay officials got correct. I know that there was some doubt as to whether or not that was a catch. But since it was called a touchdown on the field, I just didn't think there was enough to overturn. So it was the correct call. But it showed just on one play the progress that J.J. McCarthy's made this season, being able to fit those tight window throws between two defenders and what was ultimately maybe the biggest throw of the game. Michigan's offensive plan was very interesting. I loved watching it back because if you look at the last two games under Sharon Moore, when he was acting as the head coach, they were a little bit vanilla. Um, of course, he's an offensive line coach and is trying to kind of reestablish that dominance at the line of scrimmage but it didn't feel like in this one he had the same type of conservative approach uh maybe they were just saving the best for last <laughs> that was probably their best game plan i felt like of the entire season and just a few times when they go for it three times on fourth down you have the trick play for donovan edwards you insert Alex Orgy, the backup quarterback to run a couple plays when michigan needed to eat some time when they needed some yards to churn things out, they were able to run the ball right at Ohio State. They ate seven minutes off the clock on their final possession and ran it 42 yards. Converted two third down attempts to set up the field goal. Again, it was very obvious that they were the more physical team in the game, but they won the matchups for the most part that we said they needed to win. They won the turnover battle. 
That was massive. Minus two in the turnover battle for Ohio State. And they won the battle on the ground. They rushed for 156 yards to Ohio State's 107. Now, Michigan wasn't great on third down. That was one area where I wasn't sure <laughs> if they were that average on third down, they'd be successful. But the three fourth down attempts and conversions were ultimately the difference. Another matchup that we talked a lot about last week was Will Johnson against Marvin Harrison. Now, Marvin Harrison's amazing. Uh, it's hard to ignore just how much of an impact he's going to make on the game, even on the throws in which he's not targeted, the way he opens things up for other guys and the fear that exists every time he's on the field. It's pretty remarkable, though, that Will Johnson, who might be the most talented player on Michigan's roster, he wasn't available at the end of the game. And at, coming into the season, if you would have told me, hey, Will Johnson's not going to be on the field in a two-minute situation where Ohio State has to throw it, I would have been scared to death if I were a Michigan fan because cornerback depth would have been an area that I'd been a little concerned. Uh, and his injury is something that we will probably note if he's unavailable this week and if it's a long-term injury, which I don't think it will be, that could be significant for them moving forward. But man, Johnson, his, his importance on the game were massive. Uh, he was all over Harrison. He recognized the route on the slant where he stepped inside right before the ball was snapped. I mean, McCord had already made his decision that he was probably going to be throwing that slant. He thought he had one-on-one. -on -one. He thought he had head up to outside leverage. Well, Johnson slid inside right at the snap, squatted on it, and broke inside for a key interception that set up the first touchdown. Now, when he left the game, there was a lot of pressure on the secondary to step up, but they were able to do so. And then another thing that we talked about, too, was the pressure that Michigan might be able to apply. And the matchup between the Ohio State offense and more specifically their offensive line against that defensive line in the pass rush. Well, you look at what happened on the biggest play of the game, the final play of the game, the pressure that was provided by Jalen Harrell who had the twist with Mason Graham that knocked the left guard Donovan Jackson off his feet was enough to affect the throw, which ultimately came up short of what could have been a completion. And Rod Moore was able to trap it and go down and make the interception. Now, the injury to Zinter is heartbreaking, really, really costly. Uh, but I thought the response from Michigan after the injury was remarkable. So it showed not just their physical toughness, but their mental toughness to persevere through a terrible injury to arguably their biggest leader. So a great performance from the Michigan Wolverines, but I can't say it was surprising with how they performed in the game. Takeaway two, Ohio State's mistakes were the difference. Now, Kyle McCord, you look at the numbers, 18 of 30, 271, two touchdowns. Most people would look at those and say, that's a pretty solid day. But it's the two interceptions that gave Michigan the edge to ultimately get the job done. They also didn't run the ball really well. Travion Henderson just 60 yards on the game, and it really boiled down to just two plays for Ohio State. One was the Will Johnson intercepted that I, interception that I discussed earlier, where he slid inside, made the pick, and set up Wolverines on the short field. But on the final play, they had four chances to potentially score a touchdown. All right, four chances to potentially get it done. And a veteran quarterback, remember McCord's making his first start in a game of this magnitude. A veteran quarterback would have probably tried to figure out a way to get the ball out and not force it, which even if you take a sack, it's not the end of the world. It's not a good situation. It's a terrible situation, but taking a sack is not going to end the game. The decision-making under pressure there at the end, though, was massive. And he forced it. As a result, it was intercepted, and it wasn't to be for the Buckeyes. Now, a lot of people are destroying Ryan Day for the performance. I, I don't entirely agree with that. Let's just, for a moment, keep in mind and keep perspective with what Ryan Day has accomplished in his time leading the Buckeyes. He's 56-7. and seven. He's got two Big Ten championships, and he has yet to finish outside the AP top six. But if you're the head coach at Ohio State, your legacy, if you will, will be defined by how you play against Michigan. And after this past weekend, Ryan Day is now one and three. And all of a sudden, everybody's starting to draw comparisons to John Cooper. And is it low hanging fruit? Perhaps John Cooper went to 10 and one against Michigan. So Ryan Day's record isn't there just yet, but it showed 
this past weekend that there were some adjustments made by Ryan Day that I just didn't agree with. I thought he got too conservative. I think he probably, like most of us, thought the game was going to be a low-scoring defensive battle. I think that's what, what a lot of us thought it was going to be. And I get the sense as they prepared for this game and they put their plan together, Ryan Day said, hey, every drive that ends in a kick is going to be a good one for us. Even if it's a punt, that's okay because our defense has been playing great football and the last two weeks... Michigan hasn't looked great offensively, so they might have a tough time moving the ball consistently against us, even if we decide to punt and play the field position game. Well, Michigan rolled the dice on fourth down. Ohio State did not. Ohio State had a fourth and one right around midfield on their second possession. Ryan Day decided to punt. Uh, Clearly, like I said, He wanted to play field position, felt like this might be a game that could be a 17-10 type of thriller. He decided to punt. Next thing you know, Michigan gets the ball, and then they ultimately score and take the lead. Then, uh, just before halftime, they're down 14-10. They had a fourth and two from the Michigan 34. Now, Travion Henderson and, and Cade Stover and Marvin Harrison, all the great players that they have at their disposal. At the plus 34, with the clock winding down there at the end, they decided to try the field goal. Well, instead, they didn't. They allowed the clock to run all the way down, tried a 52-yard field goal, and Jaden Fielding missed that field goal. So that was another key turning point in the game. So there were a couple decisions where I felt he got too conservative in the game, in hindsight, it's 2020. I mean, you don't know how it's all going to unfold. Uh, Ryan Day didn't at that point. Sharon Moore didn't at that point. No one associated with Ohio State or with Michigan knew how the game was ultimately going to go. But when you have fourth and two at the plus 34 with the clock winding down there at the end of half, knowing that your defense had played pretty well all year, it does send a little bit of a message to your team when you decide not to go for it. Not once, but twice. They're in the first half of the football game. I thought he should have gone for it on the fourth and one. I thought he should have gone for it on the fourth and two. Even if they get stopped on the fourth and two, the likelihood of Michigan going the length of the field and kicking their own field goal was probably pretty slim, especially knowing that the field goal kicking unit has not been ideal this year to begin with. So a 52 yarder was far from a guarantee. I would have been more aggressive in that scenario, and he's definitely taken some heat for deciding to play it conservatively. But I don't think Ryan Day's a bad coach. Everybody all of a sudden thinks, he, oh, this guy can't coach. He can't win the big game. The guy was a field goal away last year. And to be honest with you, a four-play sequence away last year from potentially winning the national championship. They beat Georgia. I think they go and they beat TCU in the national championship game. So Ryan Day is an excellent coach. Excellent coach. But he didn't roll the dice. And sometimes in a game like this, you have to roll the dice. Is there anything that Ryan Day can do in the next 11 months to make the fan base believe and and get them back on board? Or does he have to wait 362 days till this game happens again? Well, they should have an edge going into next year. I I know that what does that do for me right now? It doesn't do a lot. Michigan slated to lose 14 guys. And there's a lot of buzz about Jim Harbaugh potentially going to the NFL. And there's a lot of buzz around you know, what could happen with Michigan as a result of what's gone on this offseason with the Big Ten and the suspension, all this stuff. So I think Ryan Day just needs to stay the course. They're a more physical team this year. They're a team that's better on defense this year. They have a first-year starting quarterback. And sometimes the first-year starting quarterback is going to make a mistake or two. It happens. So they're going to have more weapons at their disposal next year, potentially, than Michigan, unless Michigan goes and hits the portal hard, which they've done in the past. So it's unfortunate that your season success is defined by just one outcome, but I, I tried really hard not to look at it that way. They lost to a team that I've said all season long was better than them in their building. The outcome was not a surprise. At least it wasn't to me. Takeaway number three, there is no such thing as an ugly win in the Iron Bowl. You take it and run. <laughs> now, Some wins are prettier than others in the Iron Bowl. And there are some wins that are a little bit less stressful. And I'll put my crimson colored glasses on for a moment. I wanted to jump out of the booth in Atlanta when the snap went behind Jalen Milrow. I wanted to then jump out of the booth and try to land on on a body part and inflict myself pain when he decided to throw the ball on the third down. 
where it was past the line of scrimmage. I was about to die. Sean McDonough can attest. Our entire booth crew can attest. Mike Swanson, Zach Richard Pizone, uh, Richard Pizone, uh, our spotter, our A1, our A2, everyone on the headset. There were curse words. There were things thrown. There was frustration. I was about to freaking lose it. And then a miracle happened. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to live that way. So I'll remove the crimson color glasses now and we'll discuss the game and what exactly went down. Uh, 31 yard pass to Isaiah Bond there in the corner of the end zone. It, it was an amazing throw, perfectly placed. And it was probably even better played by Isaiah Bond because when you're throwing the ball, you're traveling, you're throwing it from your own 31. That means you're probably five or six yards back. So you're throwing it around 35, 36 yard line. The ball is going to be in the air for about 46 yards, which means you're probably going to throw it. You're going to need some time for the running backs and the wide receivers to get down there. You're probably going to need about five seconds. The fact that Auburn decided to run rush just two makes absolutely no sense to me. If I'm a quarterback, I'm thrilled that that was the defensive call that they decided to make. They decided to rush two. They decided to spy the quarterback because they thought Jalen Milrow might run for it. I don't know why. Uh, and they decided to play soft zone and, and kind of picket fence there, there in the back of the end zone. But you're not going to allow, the receiver is going to be covered when you throw the ball. He has to separate with suddenness to create the separation because if the ball's in the air that long, even a window that was open initially is going to close. The defenders are going to recover. So it was excellent job by Isaiah Bond separating at the right time at the last possible moment to create just a little bit of space between him and the defender to reel it in there in the back right corner of the end zone. Now, some people have said it was a push off. Some people would have said, well, you know, it, it could have been OPI. Understandable. Uh, at the game, there were a number of missed calls throughout the game, a number of missed calls throughout the game. I thought it was a really not a well-officiated game whatsoever. Um, so such is life. And if it comes down to the last play of the game, you never want to leave it up to the officials. No official wants to throw a penalty flag on a fourth and 31 to give a team new life. No one wants to throw a, a penalty flag that could be remembered forever. So I think more often than not, officials are going to be conservative in that situation. It was well played by bond. I thought he didn't extend fully. He extended just enough to be able to create a separation so I could understand the no calls. I didn't have a problem with it whatsoever. Like I said, that's removing the crimson glasses. I did not have a problem with it. I really didn't. But early in the game, there were a few things wiped out by a penalty for Alabama. Uh, they scored on their first three drives, but were only credited with one. They had a couple penalties that negated touchdowns. And this has been a theme all season long for Alabama. This past weekend, that was the seventh and eighth touchdowns that were erased due to penalty. They were up 7 nothing there midway through the first quarter. They had the fourth and one on the second possession of the game near midfield. They go with the sweep to Kendrick Law, goes the distance for a touchdown, but it was a hold on C.J. Dupree that pushed the offense back and they were forced to punt. Could have been a 14 nothing lead. Uh, then it led to a bad punt. Auburn gets the ball at their own at the 32 yard line and boom, Auburn goes right down the field for their first touchdown of the game. They ran the ball all the way down the field too. So that was of concern. Then on the next possession, it was 11 plays and it was a third and seven from the Auburn 10 yard line. Milrow, for whatever reason, goes way beyond the line of scrimmage and was flagged for the illegal forward pass on the touchdown that would have been to Amari Nyblack. So that was not a good decision by Milrow, but it was a really bad play. If he would have just hung tight let them come to him. Make the defense commit. It's not like basketball a little bit. Make the defense commit, and then you throw it instead of attacking forward, losing track of where you're at on the field, and then throwing the football. So that was a really bad play as well. So they had to settle for the Rikert field goal. So they had a couple touchdowns wiped out, but I thought everything kind of culminated there at the end of the half. One of the biggest highlights of the day, Alabama needing an answer. They were not in a really great spot. Auburn quickly answered with a three-play, 88-yard drive to take a 14-10 lead with 2.24 remaining there in the first half. And then Auburn didn't make a lot of mistakes in the game. They did not make a lot, but they made one on this particular play. The secondary, for whatever reason, had a miscommunication where the safety thought he was responsible for the hook flat. The corner thought he was responsible for the hook flat. Jermaine Burton goes right by him, takes it the rest of the way for a big touchdown, and Alabama regains the lead going into halftime. One area in particular that was really a big determining factor in the game was third down. Uh, I thought Milrow was decent on third down. 
but they were only two of nine on third down in the second half. You had the big 19-yard scramble on third and 20 to set up the fourth down run by Roydell Williams, but next thing you know, you had the miscommunication on the snap between him and Seth McLaughlin. They're back 18 yards, and then on third and 26, they had the illegal throw down field. They're back another five before the game-winning thing. Uh, game-winning throw actually materialized. A few things that Alabama needs to clean up. They did not do a good job in the first half against the run at all, and it kind of continued throughout the game. They gave up about nine and a half yards of carry. When you take away the sack-adjusted yardage, it's about 181 in the first half. Jarquez Hunter was the main, he was the main threat, and we talked about it last week going into it. Jarquez Hunter is the guy that has to have a big game if Auburn's going to make this thing interesting. Well, in the first half, 10 rushes for 80 yards. Uh, He was legit and played great. And there were 10-plus yard rushes by four different Auburn players. They also can't allow big plays because if there's one thing Georgia can do well and all the teams that they might face down the road, they can do well, they can all manufacture big plays. That's passes of 15-plus yards and rushes of 10-plus yards. That was huge. They give up 10 big plays in the game. Three long passes and seven long runs for 73% of the total offensive yards surrendered. So Alabama's got to clean that up as well. But survive in advance, especially when you're injured in hair. But Alabama will now set their sights on the Georgia Bulldogs, who did look a little susceptible in their performance last week against Georgia Tech. Do you think the close win against Auburn will hurt them in the rankings? Like, Will they stay eight and have Ohio State in front of them? It'll be interesting to to watch that. I, I think Ohio State and where they drop is going to be one of the most fascinating discussions that we'll have on Tuesday night's show. How far should they drop? Uh, the committee has obviously recognized how good their resume has been. So with the resume being as strong as it is, will that be beneficial to Ohio State? Potentially. I think Ohio State will move to eight, but I don't know for sure. The committee has shocked me multiple times this year. And it wouldn't be surprising to me at all if I'm shocked on Tuesday as well. Hey, college football fans, I'm going to let you in on a little secret that will help you win game days this season. Eckrich Smoked Sausage. You're probably asking yourself, Greg, could it be that easy? Absolutely it is. Eckrich Smoked Sausage is crafted with a perfect medley of spices for a truly rich, savory taste. They are delicious all by themselves or in any recipe you can dream up. If the word recipe sounds like a lot of work, don't worry. Visit Eckrich.com for dozens of simple, mouth-watering recipes, making your tailgate prep a stress-free event. So there you go. Eckrich Smoked Sausage is the secret to winning game days. You can thank me later. Visit Eckrich.com for more. Takeaway number four, Florida State did what they had to do. They overcame that 12-0 deficit, and it wasn't pretty. But they found just enough plays, especially in the run game, to pull away late. And the defense, I thought, did a pretty dang good job of containing Florida's offense, even though there were some moments that were certainly left to be desired. I thought the defense in the fourth quarter, they held the offense, the Florida Florida Gator offense, to negative 15 yards. Uh, They gave up 232 total yards, uh, only 86 through the air. So even though early in the game, it kind of struggled, and Florida was off to a really nice start on third down, especially they had converted five of their first six. I didn't think that it was a great start by Florida State, but they settled in and this has been a resilient bunch all season long that they could just continue to find a way. There was a questionable call early, I thought, and the Gators took advantage of. Uh, they were seven nothing lead there in the second quarter. Florida State, and their safety, Akeem Dent, they sacked Max Brown for the 10-yard loss on third down, but they flagged Dent for a personal foul, which uh, it didn't seem like to me was was a questionable hit. I thought it was I thought it was pretty clean, to be honest with you. And then a little bit later on, Florida State had that fake punt there in the second quarter, and Florida, by the way, has been has had a bunch of issues on special teams at times this year, but they were penalized by delay of game. So there are a couple things that Florida State did that kind of let Florida off the hook just a little bit. But either way, it was, for the most part, uh, a pretty good performance from Florida State, given the fact they didn't have anywhere near their best stuff. Now, defense, they had a difficult time stopping the run earlier this year, and the Gators found some success running the football with Montrell Johnson. He had 18 carries for 107 yards and a touchdown but they weathered the storm. 
I thought Florida State did a really good job of weathering the storm and kind of settled in and then started to apply pressure on Max Brown, who was making his first career start. They had six sacks, 11 tackles for a loss. Brown completed just nine of 16 passes for 86 yards and the interception. Now, Tate Rodemaker uh, wasn't great. He looked a little bit early on like he was afraid to kind of drive it, didn't really cut it loose until he ripped that one down the middle. That kind of got his day started a little bit. And you look at the numbers after the fact, it wasn't great. Just 12 of 25 for 134 yards. Now, he came up huge. Rodemaker did. He came up huge, like the throw to Ja'Kai Douglas when Jaden Hill was in tight coverage on the fourth and three from the 34-yard line. That was massive in the fourth quarter. It obviously set up the field goal to put the Seminoles ahead. And then when he was knocked out of the game, he missed four plays. He returned back in time to hand it off to Benson for the game ceiling score. So it was pretty impressive, I thought, from Rodemaker to return from that play. It was such a dumb play by Florida. I mean, I just can't even sum up how dumb it was. He's sliding. You decide to get the late hit. You get the bad decision, targeting all these other things. It would have been off the field. Instead, it gives Florida State new life. They go down and they take advantage of it. And that's what good teams do. When you give them an inch, they become a ruler. That's exactly what happened when Florida made the late hit on Rodemaker and they ultimately lost the game as a result. I thought the run game was pretty solid for the Florida State Seminoles, and they're going to have to continue to be able to run the football until Tate Rodemaker gets comfortable. And look, uh, it's it's a little bit strange in the postseason. Now, they got to get through this one. Louisville's tough. Louisville's good. And I know they lost to Kentucky this past weekend, but Louisville's a really good defensive group. That was not a very characteristic performance from Louisville on the defensive side this past weekend. So Tate Rodemaker's going to have to play great this weekend. But if they can somehow get through this one, one, they'll be in the playoff. Two, and anyone that suggests they won't be, I, I don't agree with you. I, I, don't, I don't think the committee will do that. If you're undefeated as a Power 5 champ, you'll be in. So I think Florida State is in full control of their own destiny in victory on Saturday night against the Louisville Cardinals. But he's going to have 15 practices, Tate Rodemaker will, to get comfortable prior to a playoff setting. That's the equivalent of a spring practice. So he's basically going to have a whole load of practices to be able to progress and get comfortable. So if he can just survive through this one and they can run the ball with effectiveness and they can be good enough on defense to slow down a rushing attack for Louisville that is a handful, they should be in pretty good shape because there were some gashes created by Florida. That would be something I'd be real concerned about playing against Louisville, who has a one-two punch at running back. Even though Jawar Jordan hasn't been at 100% down the stretch, has had the knee issue, has had a hamstring issue. Isaac Arendo at times has been really good. I think it's going to be really important for Florida State to play great on defense this week, but we'll break that thing down here in a couple days. Takeaway number five. Texas finally gives us a 60-minute performance. Now, their regular season is done. They can officially check the first goal off the list, the 57 to 50 or 57 to 7 50 point victory margin of defeat against Texas Tech was really impressive there in Austin on Friday afternoon evening. Uh, a Big 12 championship game is now looming, and they are one step closer to their first conference title game since 2009. Now, there was plenty of motivation going into this one, built up from a year of. Uh, after they lost in overtime to Texas Tech in Lubbock last year. And then it was even highlighted even more when Brent Yormark there in the preseason told Joey McGuire, the head coach of Texas Tech, quote, you better take care of business, end quote. And McGuire saying, quote, everything runs through Lubbock, end quote. That was the postgame speech after beating Texas last year. They played that on repeat in the weight room all week long. And then, of course, it came out there on the video board as Texas was putting the finishing touches on what was a complete performance for the first time in a while, man, we had not seen Texas put a full game together in months. It's been months since we've seen a 60 minute performance, but I'm glad the world finally got to take notice of just what this team is capable of when they put it all together. They are crazy talented. They have great depth. They're good where you want to be good. They have excellent skill positions. They have elite defensive lineman that can take over the game at any one given point and a bunch of them I might add it's not just one that just takes over no it's a bunch of them and then the offense 
We'll get to them in a minute, but let's start with the defense. Uh, Tavondre Sweat, I mean, at 360 plus pounds, he lived in the backfield. Lived in the backfield, but Byron Murphy, Alfred Collins, Baron Sorrell, Justice Finkley, even Jet Bush. Uh, they were getting after Baron Morton throughout the course of the game. And we said last week, look, I didn't think this game was going to be competitive. I didn't think it'd be this much of a beatdown, but it was a bad matchup for Texas Tech. The team that wants to live running the ball between the tackles. And that's one thing you just can't do against the Texas Longhorns. They're too good up front. Their defensive tackles are just too good. Now, offensively, another thing we talked about last week was how will Texas perform in the red zone? Well, a couple of issues here. They scored just one touchdown on their first five red zone penetrations on Friday. So that that's significant, and that's something that continues to be concerning. And if you don't score touchdowns, whether it's against Oklahoma State this weekend or against whoever you might play in the playoff, assuming you get there, you're going to have some issues. They have got to correct the woes in the red zone. They're among the most explosive offenses in the country, but for whatever reason, when the field condenses, it just hasn't been good for Steve Sarkeesian and the Horns this year. But the margin for error has been tight, and they've had some close calls against Houston, K-State, TCU. Those have all been really nerve-wracking. But Texas Tech, man, that was what we want to see from them all season long. We finally got it. It was a little late, but we finally got it. And Steve Sarkeesian and the Longhorns, they talked all offseason about embracing the expectations, playing to a standard. Well, they haven't always played to that standard. They played to it on Friday night. And I think they reminded everybody in college football just what they're capable of if they put it all together. Takeaway number six. Washington rolls the dice and wow. Wow. I mean, unbelievable. Now, 12 and 0 is, is an incredible feat, but every single Washington fan has to be watching every week with some type of, I mean, you're, you're taking years off people's lives. <laughs> it's just every week, it just couldn't be more stressful. Absolutely could not be more stressful. They're the only team, though. To go undefeated since the Pac-12 expanded to a dozen members back in 2011. So credit to the Washington Huskies for getting the job done. They are, I think, as gutsy and as difficult to play against. It can beat you in so many different ways. But I didn't anticipate this one going down to the wire. I thought it'd be close. We talked about the fact that it could be close and that Washington State actually matched up pretty well against Washington. But Washington ultimately just had a little bit more, but really came down to one play. It was probably the boldest decision of Kalen DeBoer's coaching career. And it required a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, creativity, um, ingenuity, uh, something that was set up over the course of the game. And I had read some of the clips after the game, and I didn't get to watch it because I was getting ready to go on the air. And I didn't get to watch it live, so I couldn't wait to get back because everyone's saying, oh my goodness, what a bold roll of the dice and all these other things. So I was so excited to get back and watch the tape. My goodness, they set that thing up from, I mean, from, from the first play of the game, they were setting that thing up. Now, it was kind of a bumpy game and it, and it wasn't ideal, uh, but they got the play and they had the poise to run the play with great efficiency there at the very end and what a decision it was made by Michael Penix. Now he won't get credit for it because there's nothing in the stat sheet that would give him credit for how things went. Now a minute and 15 seconds remain. I'll set the table for you. Okay. A minute and 15 seconds remaining. The game's 21 all Washington has a fourth and one at their own 29 yard line. Now at first they were in a punt formation and they, they tried to get a freebie by getting Washington State to jump offside. I'm sitting there thinking, all right, well, you know, take a timeout. No big deal. No, no, no. That's, that's, uh, it's not, they called timeout thinking, all right, they're just going to punt it. No, that's not it. They were going for it. <laughs> and even though if they failed, Washington State would have the ball basically in field goal range already with tons of time to make that field goal even a little bit closer. And knowing too, what has Washington been all year long, right? They're a pitch and catch football team. Their strength is in their quarterback's accuracy and their wide receivers. Well, you can feature the wide receiver. 
You don't necessarily have to feature the quarterback's accuracy, and the decision made by Penix was amazing. Michael Penix had, had an option on the play. Now, he has to read the edge defender and decide whether or not he's going to hand it to Dylan Johnson or pitch it to Roma Dunze, who was sprinting around on the reverse. Now, he noticed the strong safety for Washington State. That would be Jaden Hicks, who's a great player, I might add. He was kind of squeezing towards the middle of the field, kind of squeezing towards the line. So he didn't hand the ball to Johnson. He pitched it to Odunze, who turned the corner, and he was out the gate at that point. Now, they did not move the ball really well in the second half, but that was an incredible read, incredible acknowledgement by Penix, seeing the defender that he thought he could get leverage with and against giving it to Odunze, and it obviously led to a big game and ultimately won the game. Uh, Penix did an amazing job on that play. I just can't stress that enough. Now, the Huskies, they're in the second half of the season. They got to figure a few things out. Offensively, Jalen McMillan, uh, who's excellent, but he's been in and out of the lineup because of injury. Jalen Polk has all of a sudden had some inconsistency catching the football. The stats the last few weeks have not been great compared to what they were early. But they have become just a little bit more balanced. They still, though, have not been able to consistently run the football, just three and a half per carry against Washington State this past weekend. So they'll have their hands full this week against Oregon. My goodness, what a gutsy call by Kalen DeBoer to get the job done. Unbelievable, unbelievable decision and execution. Do you think Washington, having won six of their last eight games by single scores, do you think that will have benefit them kind of maybe if they beat Oregon and into the playoffs, or is it kind of just – coming to a head before this Pac-12 championship game where it's finally going to catch up with them? Well, I mean, if you, all you got to do is win, right? Just win. doesn't matter if it's by one or a hundred. They've found different ways to win. I think the variety with which how Washington has won is really impressive. And, and I know some people, if you're not blowing teams out, it's like, oh my goodness, they're flawed. Fair enough. I don't disagree. There are some things that Washington can do better. I completely, totally subscribe to that idea because even in the game in which they weren't, winning by one possession. Uh, it was a game in which they gave up 42 points and 500 plus yards of offense to USC. So th there are flaws on that team. They are imperfect, but they're one win away. And it gets against a team they've beaten already. Now they're a heavy underdog coming into this game, but maybe that will work in their favor going against the Oregon Ducks who seem to be clicking in all the right ways. Let's go to takeaway seven. I think Oregon's defense needs a little more love. Now, their offense has been getting plenty of love, plenty of love, which is deserving. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But you got to love how Dan Landing leading up to the game, uh, whether it was on the boards in the locker room, the video screens in the locker room, they were showing the Ducks losing the 31-10 lead there in the second half. It was poor tackling, mis mistakes in the kicking game, bad decisions, uh, poor execution, you name it, they did it there in the second half against Oregon State a year ago. And we had kind of laid it out in this game saying, I wonder if Oregon State's going to use a ball control type of approach. Uh, that, was, that was what we thought would be their path to victory. Would they use ball control and would that be advantageous in, in the game to kind of shrink the game, take the air and the offensive rhythm away from Oregon? Well, it's quite the opposite. It was actually Oregon that used some ball control. <laughs> they started the game and, and trying to open the, open the game with their first possession. They controlled the ball almost nine minutes on the first score. And at the half, Oregon had a 19 to 11 margin of time of possession. So it was very much the opposite of how I anticipated it went there with the ball control and the end of half sequence was probably the biggest indicator of how this game was going to go. Oregon State finally gets something going. They go right down the field, 80 yard drive. They score with 48 seconds left in the half. Next thing you know, Oregon State's getting the ball first in the second half and everyone's starting to feel just a little bit shaky given how the second half went last year for Oregon State. But things were very different. Uh, Oregon gets the ball back. Bo Nix runs for 11 yards, hits three or four passes, and then a cross-field throw to Troy Franklin for a 48-one-yard touchdown with eight seconds remaining. That basically stymied any idea that there would potentially be a comeback in the game. And that 40 seconds, that 40 seconds out of the 60-minute ball game, that 40 seconds, I think, really told the story because their gap had closed. 
Felt like Oregon State had seized momentum. They were getting the ball in the second half. And boom, in that 40 seconds, all hopes felt like they had gone out the window. All the confidence and enthusiasm was then put onto the other sideline with the Oregon Ducks. But let's give credit to the defense here, man. The defense, and while Bo Nix was amazing, we'll talk about him in a moment, the defense in this game was terrific. Absolutely terrific. Oregon State converted three third down tries. It was all on their touchdown drive, I might add, out of 11 attempts and turned the ball over five times. An interception and four fourth down conversion failures. They held Oregon State to 53 yards rushing. And the second leading rusher in the Pac-12, Damian Martinez, had only 38 yards. The longest run of the game was six yards for Damian Martinez. That's amazing. Especially when you think about the fact that this guy's averaging six plus yards per carry coming into the game. He averages 2.2 per carry in this game. So Tosh Lupoy, the defensive coordinator, and the entire defensive staff, they did an amazing job. They've rotated a ton of players this year. They've played a lot of depth. They've established a lot of, of solid depth and guys that have accelerated their development. They have held six of their opponents to one touchdown or less. So Oregon, traditionally, we have always given credit to the offense, right? Whether it was the Chip Kelly era, the Mark Helfrich era, even at times the Dan Lanning era. The credit has always been given to the offense, but the defense is what makes this Oregon team different. And then they also have a quarterback in Bo Nix who finished 33 of 40 for 367 and two touchdowns. But I thought it was probably his best performance of the year. They didn't allow a sack. You got to give credit to not just the offensive line, but the Bucky Irving and Jordan James as well. They were great in protection. They Oregon State at times tried to bring more than four rushers. They tried to overload it every once in a while, and Bo Nix had time. And when he did escape, he was able to find guys open downfield. So much of what Bo Nix has done this year has been dink and dunk, short passes, catch and run situations. It's been real accurate on those. But he hasn't pushed the ball down the field with a ton of consistency. He hasn't had to. But he showed that he can, without question, this past week. And a couple of throws that he pulled off, off his back foot, across his body, still being accurate on the move. I thought he was terrific in this game. And I think he's one win away and one great performance away from potentially winning the Heisman Trophy. Mmm. You smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper, which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right, the fans are back, and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint. Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Takeaway number eight. And you'll notice with 8, 9, and 10, it's all about new coaches. So a lot of people getting new coaches this year. So let's break it down a little bit. Jonathan Smith is the new head coach at Michigan State. Former Oregon State Beavers quarterback finished 35 or 34 and 35 in his six years at his alma mater. But the last couple of years have been really different. 18 and 7 in the last two years. He was 8 and 4 this year. He was Pac-12 coach of the year with Washington's Kalen DeBoer in 22. And to finish... At number 17 in college football is a pretty remarkable feat. Uh, and to win the way they won against Florida in the bowl game to finish 10 and 3 was a pretty remarkable feat. He followed it up this year with, I think, a really solid season. A really solid season. Now, they had a really long, uh, or Michigan State, did. they had a really long time to be able to survey the landscape and figure out and identify who they wanted. And it was pretty clear that they went after Smith. And I, I think. Jonathan Smith is a really good football coach, a really good football coach. He's a great talent developer. And you think about what Michigan State has had success with in the past. They have not been a group that has consistently landed top five recruiting classes, not even top 10 recruiting classes. But when Michigan State was at their best, they're in the 2010 to 2015, 16 area. They were developing talent from within and that's exactly what Jonathan Smith has done in his time as the head coach at Oregon State. Now, I think there's a lot to like about this marriage because I get the sense that Michigan State, in a new frontier, are they going to be able to 
recruit alongside that of Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, uh, USC, Oregon, Washington? Uh, maybe. I, I really don't know. I, I, but I know this. I know that Jonathan Smith is going to find a way to be able to create balance offensively. I think he's going to have a team that plays with tremendous effort. He's going to have a team that is outstanding when it comes to being physical and being able to try to create an edge running the football. Now, he's never been outside of the Pacific Northwest, but the Big Ten is expanding to that area with the addition of Washington and Oregon along with SC and UCLA. So I love the hire. I think it's a perfect fit. I really do. I think it's a perfect fit, and I think Jonathan Smith will have success. I really do. I think he'll have success, even though right now I don't know what success looks like at the moment for Michigan State. I would imagine they probably want to get back to the postseason, get back to the playoff. And if Jonathan Smith can almost take Oregon State there, I think there's a real possibility he can get Michigan State back to within striking distance of that as well. Takeaway number nine, Mike Elko is the new head coach of Texas A&M. He was 16-9 and nine in two years as the head coach at Duke. And of course, had some time and experience in College Station as the defensive coordinator from 18 to 21. Now, when Texan decided to fire Jimbo Fisher, uh, there was a bunch of people that were reaching out. There were a lot of people very interested in trying to get control of this job. Now, there was some buzz that Elko might have considered Michigan State, and then there was some buzz about Texas A&M going and getting Mark Stoops. And I can tell you that the Mark Stoops scenario was very real. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of folks will will try to push back on that and say that it wasn't. It was more exploratory. No, I'm telling you, it was very real. They were about at the two-yard line ready to punch it in before they decided to kill the deal at the last minute. But I do think that Elko is a really solid candidate. If you can win nine games at Duke, that's saying something. But it's more about how he ran the program than anything else. They're going to have great defense. They're going to be well-structured. And Mike Elko is a thoughtful and cerebral coach that's going to kind of, I think, the chaos that Texas A&M has experienced at times, I think that will go away. Elko's really smart. But he does have a very interesting background. Uh, he's been in the FCS, he's been in the MAC, he's been in the ACC, he was at Notre Dame, he's been all over the place. And he's a guy that's from New Jersey, uh, played at Penn, uh, considered going into the business school at Penn, at Wharton, one of the best business schools in the country, decided to go and coach at, at Stony Brook and then Penn and then Merchant Marine. I mean, he's kind of been all over the place. He had his first D1 coaching job under Dave Clawson at Fordham and then kind of went all over the country with Dave Clawson. And then Brian Kelly acknowledged what a job he was doing at Wake Forest before becoming the defensive coordinator of Notre Dame. And then a couple years later, he went to Texas A&M with the big payday in January of 2018. I really like the hire, partly because I think structure is necessary. Now, one thing we don't know is, will Elko be able to recruit at the highest level? Well, do you need to? When you have an NIL war chest that Texas A&M has, I'm not sure it's going to matter. I mean, yes, he has not run a program of this magnitude before, but I think structure is necessary and the recruiting will take care of itself because of the NIL support that he has at Texas A&M. But this was really close to becoming Mark Stoops. And there at the 11th hour, that thing broke down and opened the door for Mike Elko. There were other candidates too, big time candidates. I won't tell you who they were, but you can look elsewhere. Billy Lucci, who covers Texas A&M for Texags. Go check out his timeline and go look at some of the candidates that were potentially involved here. Every single person that he listed is rooted in fact. They were on the short list here, but Texas A&M decided to go with Elko, which I think is a real testament to what they believe that Elko can be. He's a great, great, great football coach. Now it's just about can he run a program that's at the top of the college football world in a conference that's going to get increasingly more difficult with the addition of Texas and Oklahoma. And speaking of conference being difficult, let's go to takeaway number 10. Jeff Levy is the new head coach of Mississippi State. Now, according to my sources, this is going to come down to one of two people. It's going to be Jeff Levy or John Summerall. John Summerall is the head coach of 
the Troy Trojans. Now, he'll be the fifth full-time head coach at Mississippi State since Dan Mullen left in 2017. Now, this is the first year after 13 consecutive years of going to bowls that Mississippi State will come up short. Now, Dan Mullen and Mike Leach, to an extent, kind of set expectations by getting all the way to the number one ranking back in 2014. And Jeff Lebby, whose background is with Baylor from 2008 to 2016, used variations of the offense with Art Bryles that is really effective and has kind of added and subtracted to that from the time that he left Baylor in 16. He has since worked with Josh Heupel and Lane Kiffin, two of the more prolific offensive minds in this generation of college football and has had success at Ole Miss, Baylor, and UCF before. And you look at what he done this year. Uh, the Sooners have averaged over 500 yards of offense and 43 points a game. That's pretty dang good. And their final year at Ole Miss, they won 10 games and reached the Sugar Bowl. So Jeff Levy's accomplished an awful lot. An awful lot as an offensive coach. Now he gets a chance to run a program. A couple questions that I have. One, toughness. Uh, I think Jeff Levy will emphasize toughness at Mississippi State. I think that is of the utmost importance. Because when I think back to when I was playing against Mississippi State, or when Dan Mullen had them rolling there in the mid-2010s, they were as tough and as physical and as blue-collar a team as you might find. Now, D Dak Prescott, of course, went on to be a franchise quarterback in the NFL, so it was nice to have that going on the offense, but this was a team that ran the football and a team that was extremely stout in the front seven defensively. They also had Todd Grantham, a defensive corner, that would blitz you on every single down if he could. So I think it's going to be very important for Jeff Levy to get his defensive coordinator hire right because he's going to run the offense and they're going to score points. This is an offense that is designed to create a lot of issues, and we've seen it installed at Tennessee. We've seen it installed, uh, obviously, at Oklahoma. We've seen it installed in some ways at Ole Miss. It's an offense that is very difficult to defend. So I think he'll be very attractive for offensive personnel that are considering staying in state. There's a lot of talent in the state of Mississippi. I think he'll be great as far as creating offensive firepower, but will they be able to do enough running the football? which is what Mississippi State has traditionally hung their hat on, and will they be able to do enough on the defensive side to make this team a little bit more competitive? I think it's a good hire. I'm excited to see what Jeff Levy does. I'm especially excited to see how things will go with how he puts his staff together. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. Before we close, we'll tell you a little bit about the coaching carousel that's really starting to wind up. There are some really big fish that will not move just yet. Uh, I'll just tell you that there is a lot of thought in coaching circles that there could be some massive job openings, uh, massive openings. And we won't necessarily go into that at the moment. We won't speculate. We'll, we'll react in, if the, in the event in which some of the big jobs come open because of the NFL and other things. But there are some big fish that are not currently listening to overtures because of the possibility of some other massive openings happening because the NFL targets a head coach in college football. Uh, what have you. So just let you know, there could be some major dominoes that fall here in the next couple of weeks, but some that already have Houston uh, is open. Dana Holgerson was relieved of his duties. Where do they go from here? Remember, this is the largest school in the fourth largest city in America. Uh, and one that has 47,000 students. Okay. Now Houston's in the big 12 uh, and they have arguably the most talent, in their own backyard is just about anybody. I mean, just the city of Houston. If you recruited that alone by itself, you might be able to put together a national championship contending roster. That's how talented the city is. I think this will go in one of three directions. I would expect it to be Willie Fritz uh, at Tulane, who has 200 career wins and, of course, beat USC last year in the Cotton Bowl and has done a great job with Tulane the last couple years. But he also has a lot of clout in the state of Texas. Um, he was a high school coach in his early days, but he also worked extensively at Sam Houston State, where he twice played 
uh, for a national championship. Another name to keep an eye on would be Gary Patterson. He, of course, was the longtime head coach at TCU, uh, but left TCU in October of 2021. But he has made his desire known that he could potentially coach again. And then Jeff Trailer, uh, who's a Texas high school coach, college assistant, and has turned UTSA into a consistent winner and have helped make the program one of the best non-Power 5 programs in the country. Indiana is also open now. Tom Allen, uh, he had an Indiana rolling for a couple of years, and there was a two-year stretch there where Indiana was 11-5 and five in the Big Ten. But even, as though, even though they were playing, by the way, in the Big Ten East, they finished number 12 in the country in 2020, but when NIL came into play, they just didn't have much of a plan. So on Saturday, Indiana decided to fire... Uh, Allen after eight seasons, but we'll pay him about 20 million in buyouts. So that's a good situation to be in. So um, a bunch of names have been thrown out here, including Jason Candle, who's the head coach at Toledo, currently has a 65 and 33 record and is about to take his team to the sixth bowl game in eight years without having a losing season. Now the Toledo Rockets are 11 and one this year, and their only loss was to Illinois at the very end of the game where they lost 30 to 28. He's got ties to the Midwest. He's from Ohio. He's an offensive-minded coach. All those things, I think, are pluses for Indiana. He might be in the mix at Syracuse as well, but Jason Candle, to me, I think would be a great hire for Indiana if they can make that happen. But if it doesn't happen, I'd reach out to Kurt Signetti at James Madison, and I might reach out to Kane Womack at South Alabama, who was at one point the defensive coordinator under Tom Allen, and since he left to become the head coach of the Jaguars, hasn't been quite as good. San Diego State is also open. We'll see exactly where they go with that as Brady Hoke has decided to retire. Syracuse, Dino Babers won 10 games in 2018, but overall was just 41 and 55 in his tenure. And it's a tough, it's a tough job. Um, I think it's a tough job because you have to attract talent from warmer clients to play uh, climates to play in central New York. But the school does have an awful lot of history. And, and I think John Wildhack, the, the athletic director there, has been really surprised by the quantity of candidates that have shown an interest in taking the job. Now, uh, you keep hearing the name Dan Mullen, who's from New Hampshire. Maybe he would have an interest in, in jumping back in. I don't think he will. But if he does, it, it wouldn't shock me. That would be a great hire for Syracuse, but we'll find out according to sources they met last week. But uh, I can't confirm that, at least at the moment. The name that continues to come up, though, is Bob Chesney, who just finished his sixth year at the top of the Holy Cross program. And he's proven to be a real steady program builder throughout three head coaching stints. Now, Holy Cross has kind of reached unprecedented heights under Kresny, uh, Chesney. Excuse me. Um, They finished 12-0 through 2022, and they fell in the FCS subdivision quarters, um, but still closed the season as number six team in the country. So prior to taking over Holy Cross, he had turned Assumption into a perennial D2 power and even made a run in the playoffs there as well. So keep an eye and remember the name Bob Chesney. He might be the guy to beat with the Northeastern Roots up there. As of right now, Oregon State, nobody, I think, knows the program better than Jonathan Smith. So it's going to be very difficult to replace his leadership. Uh, Now that Jonathan Smith's going to Michigan State, he has played, went to the Fiesta Bowl as a player there. And then, of course, has has really done an amazing job. I mean, from 1971 to 1998, the Beavers had gone 28 consecutive losing seasons. But since then, they've reached 14 bowl games. Uh, A name to keep an eye on from what I've been told is Jeff Tedford, who is currently at Fresno State, has done a really good job with the Bulldogs. In 2017, he inherited a 1-11 program and went 22-6 and over the next two years, including a Mountain West championship. Now, he had to step away due to health issues. That's when Kalen DeBoer got it, and then he went to Washington, and then Tedford went back to the well. And, uh, excuse me, Fresno State went back to the well and got Tedford and was crowned with the Mountain West title and a top 25 finish last year. Uh, he's been off Oregon's offensive coordinator in the past. So he does have some familiarity there up in the state of Oregon. He's 62. That could be the one thing that could have an impact on whether or not he might be a real candidate for the job. But another name to keep an eye on, I've been told is Brian Harson, former Auburn coach, former Boise state coach. He's a guy to keep an eye on as well, not just for Oregon state, but for a handful of other jobs like Boise state and some others. Louisiana Monroe, uh, Terry Bowden lasted three years. Showed a little improvement before the wheels came off this year. Went 2-10. and 10. We'll see where they go. New Mexico is also out of coach. Danny Gonzalez, uh, 
they took him. Doesn't seem like New Mexico has the budget as of right now to bring in an experienced guy. So we'll see exactly where that thing goes. And then Dana Dilmel was relieved of his duties after a 20 and 49 record in six seasons at UTEP. So that's where we're at right now as far as the coaching carousel is concerned. We will update you as best we can as this thing spins. And I have a feeling it might spin really fast here in the next couple of weeks. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Please continue to like, rate, and subscribe. We appreciate you guys very much. Thank you again for all the support you've shown us this season. And we promise that we will continue to deliver you the best college football content anywhere here on Always College Football. For Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.